We have come, at long last, to the end of Nintendo Power's fourth year, right in time for the start of 2016. This week, we have issue 36 from May of 1992 and the results of the fourth annual Nestor Awards. I'm looking forward to those just as much as you are, so let's get started. Our cover game this issue is Darkwing Duck. This is drawn art, done less like a still from the show and more like comic book art, with hash mark gradient shading uh, underneath Darkwing's cape to give the impression of shadows. Still, the art does show how much Darkwing was influenced visually by the shadow, with a dark overcoat, though purple instead of black, and a cape with a lighter shade liner, though the shadow was black with a red liner, Darkwing is purple and violet, and with a slouch hat. Other than that, the shadow has a big red scarf with his big nose sticking out over the top, while that costume style doesn't work as well for, you know, a duck, so Darkwing instead wears a Zoro mask. Um... As you can clearly see, I bring all this up because it kind of makes looking at Darkwing Duck again after having read a bunch of the Shadow stuff and seen some cover art by Bill Sinkowitz and uh, Jim Steranko of the Shadow. I kind of want to see like art of Darkwing Duck by Steranko and Sinkovich or done in their styles. That'd be kind of neat to see. Our letters theme this issue is for what video game characters readers would like to be for a day. And unfortunately, none of these letters really stand out. It's fairly basic stuff, and we don't have any art submissions this time, really, so we can't talk about those either, which is which is kind of a bummer. Our cover game is our first game we're getting to this issue as well, since we're it's an NES title. Uh, Darkwing Duck is another Capcom title, and like DuckTales, or for that matter, the Mega Man games, you can take on the stages in almost any order. It's kind of in blocks of three. We get something of a recommended level order, and maps of most of the stages prior to the final stage of Foul Headquarters. Darkwing Duck plays a lot like Mega Man, complete with some similar enemies. There are even enemies that work exactly like Sniper Joe's, blocking your shots with a cape as opposed to a riot shield, and being open to damage only when they fire. However, there are a few very distinct and significant differences. First, while you have a smaller life bar, you are able to block shots yourself by pressing up on the D-pad to raise your cape. This won't block all attacks, but it gives you an added defensive move to your vocabulary that you didn't have at the Mega Man games. Second, rather than taking a boss's weapon when you beat them, you pick up power-ups to your gas gun that vary your shots over the course of the level. This means that there isn't really any significant order in which to take levels aside from the general difficulty of the level in particular and your own skill level. The game also handles platforming a little differently by enabling Darkwing to grab onto some ledges and jump up and down through them. Some levels also require you to grab onto objects in the environment, like hooks or pulleys, in order to proceed. In theory, this could change up the platforming in a fun way. In practice, the platforming is very finicky when you're trying to grab onto these objects. This means you can end up missing a lot of jumps for reasons that really aren't clear, causing a whole bunch of cheap deaths. It's still a fun game, but these issues are definitely something to keep in mind. Next, we have a platformer based on the Hanna-Barbera Wacky Races cartoon, where you're playing as Muttley. I think this is the first game we've gotten where you are overtly playing as the villain of the licensed work. Also, this is kind of a stylistic shift from the original work, in that this isn't a racing game in any form, whether in the form of isometric games like RC Pro-Am, Pro behind-the-back rally games like Rad Racer, or vehicular platformers like City Connection. Wacky Races is a decent platformer, but that's pretty much all I can say for it. Aside from mapping the bosses onto protagonist racers from the cartoon shorts and having the protagonist of the game be the antagonist of the show, as opposed to, say, Roger Ramjet or Penelope Pitstop, this game is pretty average. Controls are decent, the level design, though, just generally falls into your bog-standard game level designs. Forest stage and plain stage, desert stage with an Egyptian motif, and so on. It feels like kind of a reskin of a Japanese platformer, just redone with the characters from Wacky Races. The third and final film 
a Robocop film of the Nintendo Power era is out, and it has a licensed title as well. Once again from Ocean, and it appears to, from the article, play pretty much the same way as the last two titles, and we get maps of the first four stages. I'm calling it now. There have never been any good Robocop games. There never were in the past, there will not be in the future. I may be proven wrong when we get to Robocop versus the Terminator, but until we get to that point, I'm not seeing any good Robocop games at all. This game just feels like Ocean isn't trying. Like they just took their crappy ZX Spectrum Robocop 3 game, put a fresh coat of paint on it, and called it good. It's the same engine as the earlier Robocop games. They just kind of upped your jump a little bit. And it's it's just bland and bad and boring and a little too difficult for its own good. I'd be disappointed, but that would imply that I'd expectations for Ocean titles, and this game in particular, and I have none. In the classified information column, we have a strategy to help you get some quick cash in Legend of the Mystical Ninja. In the Legend of Zelda comic, Link has acquired the Master Sword and now goes on to take on Aganim. We previously covered the NES version of Batman Return of the Joker. Now the game has gotten a Game Boy port, and let's see if it works a little better than the earlier version. This game is a massive exercise in frustration. This game wants to have the gameplay style of the original Sunsoft Batman game for the NES, except on the Game Boy, but it can't quite pull it off. The game gives you Batarangs as a projectile weapon, and lets you shoot your bat line at a 45 degree angle so you can swing across gaps, and brings the triangle jump from the NES game into this title. Um, but it doesn't quite make things work. The... Game doesn't give you lives, just a group of continues, which is fairly poor design from a difficulty management standpoint. Most other games, they let you get lives after a certain number of points, or have extra lives available in the environment. However, continues and getting those doesn't quite work the same way. And you also kind of have the multiplier effect with continues with most other games, where with four lives plus five continues, it effectively gives you 20 chances before you have to start over from the beginning. This doesn't really give you that. Second, the game makes water an even greater hazard for Batman than it is for the Belmont clan. Touching water at any point in the game causes you to take damage, and there are levels with changing water heights that you have to pay heed to over the course of the game. That said, this game does do some things very, very well. The graphics are really quite good, particularly the visual flourishes with the parts of the level environment that are immersed in water, the ripple effect. Additionally, the game gets the balance between large, expansive levels and sprites with character right. There are big levels, and you scroll through them vertically and horizontally, and your character sprite for Batman is small, is big enough to have character and his movements and animations and how he how his cape moves and everything else, while also being small enough that you can have enough distance in the environment to give you an idea of where you need to go next and help you plan your next moves. If the game didn't have hazard be it water be as much of a hazard, or for that matter, a hazard at all, and fix the lives problem, this game would be absolutely perfect. Next up is Re Fun Pack 4-in-1, which is a collection of four games. Chess, Checkers, Backgammon, and Reversi. This is a collection of four board games, and honestly, I'm going to say this is not actually worth reviewing, as you're either interested in playing these games electronically, or you aren't. And these four games are some of the most frequently worked on titles when it comes to experimenting on AI and random number generation. So this is a situation where generally these games are probably going to play fairly well. Speaking of titles I'm not going to review, next up is the Workboy, which is an app suite, and which also has a keyboard attachment for your Game Boy. This would be interesting to review from a hardware standpoint, sort of like the Lazy, Lazy Game Review's odd work reviews, but I don't have the hardware to do this review, so I'm going to give this a miss. That said, if somebody has done a oddware style review of the Workboy and its keyboard and all that, please let me know and post in the comments. I'd be interested in watching that. Next, we began our results for the Nestor Rewards. Um, I've only covered a couple of games this far, so I should be able to get a bit more depth here and still have time for that. First up, in the graphics and sound category, our winners are Battletoads on the NES, Metroid 2 on the Game Boy, and Super Mario World on the SNES. I buy the Game Boy and Super Nintendo picks, but I was not particularly impressed with Battletoads, with the exception of the super-fast scrolling during the jet bike sequences. 
In the theme and fun category, our winners are Battletoads on the NES, Mega Man on the Game Boy, and once again, Super Mario World on the Super Nintendo. I can dig the Super Nintendo pick, and actually the NES pick on this one, but not so much on the Game Boy pick due to the issues which I discussed in my review with the scaling of the sprites compared to the screen size. For best challenge, the winners are Ninja Gaiden 3 on the NES, Metroid 2 on the Game Boy, and Super Ghouls and Ghosts on the Super Nintendo. I think the winners on all three systems are definitely worthy. For best play control, the winners are Battletoads on the NES, Metroid 2 on the Game Boy, and Super Mario World on the Super Nintendo. Once again, I don't have much to argue about in this one either. For best simultaneous multiplayer, the winner is Battletoads on the NES, and I have to disagree strongly on this one. Due to the ability to damage your fellow player, particularly the stricken on the swinging stages, this game is very difficult and impossible to complete in multiplayer. For best villain, the winner is Bowser, and I can't really disagree here. As of the listed villains, he's got the most longevity in terms of game franchises. It's not like he's beating Kefka or anything on the list where the sheer quality of the villain outweighs the quantity of their body of work. For most innovative game, Final Fantasy II wins, and I buy this. This is the most strongly narratively focused game on a Nintendo console to date, both in terms of quality and quantity of the game's narrative. Before this, game narrative was basically predominantly told through out-of-engine cutscenes like the Ninja Gaiden games. Here, the story is kept in engine and is very involved and intricate with a lot of things being discussed here with characters agonizing decisions and making choices, as opposed to the relative blank slates of the of your party in the first Final Fantasy game on the NES. Finally, we get to our winners for each console. Best NES game winner is Battletoads, which I disagree with, but I understand. The Toads were catching, cashing in on the same wave of hype that brought us Turtle Mania. For best Game Boy game, we have Metroid 2, and this is a very solid game and an excellent continuation of the series and is definitely worthy of the win. For best Super Nintendo game, we have Super Mario World, which is unquestionably a solid pick, particularly since a lot of players are sp split on this and Super Mario Bros. 3 as being the best Mario game. Moving on to the comics, in Super Mario Adventure, Princess Peach has escaped and now Mario has been captured, which means Luigi and Peach have to step up to save Mario himself. In Counselor's Corner, we have some tips for Link to the Past and Adventures of Lolo 3. Moving on to Super Nintendo games, we have Zardion. We have some basic notes on, on each level of this mecha action game, and not much on the gameplay. It looks like the game is something of a run and gun. Zardion is an interesting game. The controls on the level design are fine enough, but what hooks me is the three different robots you can switch between. Triton, El Cedes, and Panthera. Each of the three have different special abilities, though for most of the game you'll probably be playing as Triton, as that robot plays more conventionally, with the ability to shoot vertically in addition to horizontally. The animations of the game are pretty good, and the movements of the robots have some real weight to them, as you expect from Mecha, and the designs of the robots in general are very well done, which is not too surprising, as the game developers contracted with Gynax, the studio that did Gunbuster and Evangelion, to do the mechanical design. Next up is Super Adventure Island. Master Higgins is back with another platformer, now with 16-bit gameplay. We have maps of most of the game on the poster. This game is a return to the difficulty level of the first Adventure Island game. A lot of the power-ups have been removed, there are no companion animals, and with it, no ability to swap out animals between levels, because there are no animals. It's just you, on your own, with your stone axe, boomerang, or fire. That's probably the main power-ups that they've kept in the earlier games, is you have the boomerang upgrade and the fire upgrade combined with being able to shoot more shots based on how many power-ups you've collected. It's a decent enough game. The difficulty is rough, but it's playable. If you enjoy the Adventure Island games, you'll certainly enjoy this one. Next up is Contra 3 The Alien Wars. It's been a while since we had a Contra game, and now we've got one with the first title on a 16-bit console in this franchise. We have maps of most of the game. Contra 3 is a strong installment of the Contra series with some good refinements on the classic formula. In particular, 
you have two slots for your power-ups, with the active power-up being lost if you're hit, and that which is a really good idea, a really good innovation. I do have a couple problems with this game. First, the behind-the-back running stages from the first game have been replaced with top-down stages, and the handling for these stages is fairly clunky, with the D-pad handling movement and the shoulder buttons handling turning. It almost feels like it'd be better with Smash TV-style controls. Additionally, the Konami code is completely absent, and there's nothing that really replaces it as far as the 30 Lives code is concerned. At least not the U.S. version. It is there for the Japanese version. This is kind of a bummer because with the original Contra, this was the great equalizer. It lets players with a more mundane skill level get through the game and then improve on repeat plays. Here, you just kind of got to keep banging your head against the wall until you break through. Otherwise, this is a very excellent game. We have two soccer games being showcased this issue as well. Nintendo Super Soccer, developed by Human, and Taito Super Soccer's Champ, with a side-by-side -side comparison on how they control. Super Soccer feels like a game where the developer, Human, really wanted to show off the potential of Mode 7 graphics without properly implementing Mode 7 scale and scrolling with, all, with the gameplay. Aiming passes is a mess. You select, effectively kick the ball in one of six directions without actually trying to direct your pass or shot to the selected player. Sure, you can highlight a player you'd like to pass to, but if you actually try to pass, good luck getting the ball to that player, even if you're just tossing the ball in from the sidelines. Super Soccer Champ is a port of the arcade game by the same name from Taito. Well, it plays like an arcade soccer game with very basic controls, very fluid animation, and AI that really wants to kick your butt. Aside from the AI being balanced more towards quarter chomping than a balanced home gameplay experience, I'd say the only other real problem this game, this game has is the camera perspective is a little bit too close to the player. It's something just a little bit zoomed further out, though I can understand why it's at the distance since you as a player need to be able to track the, the sprite for the ball and be able to see the animations for some of the moves you get in the game, including taking a dive when you're slide tackled. It's been a while since we made a profile of a game developer, and we're getting one this issue with a look at Sculptured Software, who has done a lot of contract work, particularly for Parker Brothers and LJN. In Nestor's Adventures, Nestor and Link have to capture a bee with a net. The problem is, well, teamwork isn't exactly Nestor's strong suit. In the now playing column, the only title that really stands out that wasn't featured in the magazine is Raiden Trad, or Triad, for the Super Nintendo. In the top 20 polls, Mario once again has been turned to claim the top spot on all three consoles. This issue's celebrity profile is of Melissa Joan Hart, of course, I explains it all. Melissa is still working, having appeared as both T Sabrina the Teenage Witch and also as Sabrina's aunt in various incarnations of that show along with numerous other recurring roles in live action and in voice acting. Her most recent role has been in the long-running Disney family sitcom Melissa and Joey. In the Pack Watch column to close out the issue, Lemmings is getting a Super Nintendo port, and I'm kind of interested in seeing how this game controls. Also, Romancing Saga has just came out in Japan, taking advantage of the latest Dragon Quest game getting pushed back a bit. For my picks of the issue, I'm going to go with Contra 3 as my def as my definite pick of the issue. It's a classic run-and-gun title and a worthy successor to the legacy of the series. As a fallback pick, I'm going with Darkwing Duck as a great adaptation of the Mega Man style of gameplay, but without the weapon theft. Next time, we begin our path through the best of the rest of Nintendo Power's fourth year, and this time, we have three platforms to, color to cover. If you enjoyed the show, please like the video and subscribe to my channel to be notified when the next episode comes out. If you really want to support the show and help my production quality improve, please feel free to toss a few bucks my way, either through my Patreon or through my tip chart. Patreon link is down below in the show notes. I are also up here if you're watching on the YouTube page. Tip chart link is up there as well. Thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you next time.